All right, so much to cover today in this message. His name shall be called, and today we come to the third exalted title, Everlasting Father. Let's see it right there in the text. Uh, Isaiah, oh, I'm sorry, did I skip a slide, Katie? Oh, that, okay. Katie, you could have blamed me. It would have been a perfect opportunity. Uh, guys, Katie really messed me up today. It's her fault. Uh, not at all. His name shall be called, and we've gone through the first two exalted titles, right? Wonderful Counselor. Last week, if you didn't hear Matt's message last week, wow. Uh, the Mighty God. My daughter, my oldest daughter here is about 21, was here, and uh, has not stopped talking about that message all week how much it meant to her. So if you haven't had a chance, I'd urge you to go back and listen to it. And today, we consider this third title, which is a little strange if you've been in the church world for any length of time because of this question. Shouldn't we make a pretty big deal about God being the Father and Jesus being the Son, right? If, you, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you've probably learned that's an important distinction, right? I mean, there's God the Father who sends God the Son into the world uh, to save us. So why would God the Son, that's how this passage starts, right? Unto us, a child is born. Unto us, a what? Son is given. How is he now called everlasting Father? Well, honestly, when I first sat down to prep this, I thought this could be the entire message to just unpack that question. I'm just going to eliminate the suspense, piggyback on something Matt shared last week. I thought he gave it away. Uh, there's a passage in the Gospel of John that is incredibly helpful to think through this issue. Philip, one of Jesus' original followers, an apostle, says, Lord, show us the Father. You keep talking about the Father. Can you show him to us? And it will be enough for us. If you just give us a glimpse of him. Jesus' response is striking. Notice what he says in the next verse. Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? What does he say? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? So what Jesus is doing there is, by, is telling us that he is the perfect expression of his Father's character, his Father's will, his Father's heart. Now, if you think, well, I'm just seeing too much in that verse, all of Scripture unpacks that idea. I'm just going to give you one key one from the book of Hebrews, uh, the one that forbids women to make coffee. All right, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, have a great week, and uh, we'll see you never. Um, yeah, Hebrews, sorry. Please, when Lisa's here at the next service, don't tell her I did that. Scrub that from the archive for all time. Um, the, the writer of the book of Hebrews describes Jesus in exalted language. I love this passage. It says, In these last days, he, that is God, the Father, has spoken to us, by his son. So it's as if the father says, I'm going to make my son the mouthpiece for my word, my will, the disclosure of all that I want to speak. This son, God the father appointed to be the heir of all things. And through him, through Jesus, he created the world. Now notice how Jesus is described in the next sentence. He is the radiance of the glory of God. Wow. And the exact imprint some say replica of his nature when you replicate something what do you do you in in essence you you could say you copy it you duplicate it when you see it you see the original as it were the radiance is the outshining of light and i love that that's very similar to how the word glory is often used in scripture so here we learn that god shows us god the father who he is through the person of his son, Jesus, and how wonderful and compassionate the Father must be. He didn't leave his character up in the blue nowhere, out in the ether, where we can speculate and philosophize on what he may or may not be. Like, he shows us through a flesh and blood manifestation. Hands, feet, hair, eyes, fully human, as we've been considering in this series. We see Jesus we know what the Father is like. 
And I want to springboard from that into the takeaway thought this morning, which is this, that Jesus is God the Father's perfect expression of two things, really. His love for and his protection of his children. His love for and his protection of his children. Let's consider, again, Isaiah 9, 6, this idea of Jesus, Jesus, this baby that would be born 700 years after Isaiah penned these words to show us something of the Father. And let's consider first that Jesus shows the Father's love for his children. The, the scriptures of ancient Israel were chock full of descriptions of God's compassion. Notice Psalm 103. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. As a father shows compassion. I want to identify something right out of the gate. I've been here for any length of time. I talk about my earthly dad a lot. You know, he's 78 years old. Uh, Many ways I consider him my my best friend, dearest friend on the planet, really. And uh, he's a very compassionate man. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, When I first heard that God was a father, my heart leapt for joy. Because I know what a father is. Some of you, some of you did not have that experience. And I know some of you who have told me about your experience of, dare I say, maybe an abusive father. Or a distant father. A distracted father. An absentee father. And, And I recognize that when you're hearing this that we have the ideal painted as a springboard for the eternal. As a father shows compassion to his children, in other words, that's God's expectation that fathers would be compassionate to their children. This is a mirrored reflection of God's fatherly affection toward us. Now notice how the love of God the Father here in the Old Testament is reflected in the person of his son in the new. Look at Matthew chapter 9. When Jesus saw the crowds, I love this, He had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Had a beautiful picture of Jesus looking at the crowds thinking, they're just aimlessly wandering. Nobody's guiding them. Nobody's protecting them. Nobody's loving them. And his heart is stirred. It is moved with great affection for the masses. You see that reflected in some of the most tender, intimate language Jesus ever uses when he talks to his followers in Luke 12. And he says, fear not, little flock, for it is what the Father's good pleasure, I love that, to give you the kingdom. Now that's kind of fanciful biblical language. You know what that means? It just feels good to give things. And you you ever have that experience? Like I have actually come to enjoy Christmas morning watching my kids excited about the gifts, you know, and when Lisa and I give each other the kind of, you know, nonverbal high five in our minds that, man, we thought he would like this and he loved it more than we could. It feels good. This is what Jesus is describing about his father's disposition. Do you know my father feels good? He enjoys giving you the kingdom, all his blessings. God is a benevolent, giving father most famously reflected in the goalpost verse, right? John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he what? Gave his only son. If you want to measure the depth of affection, what is it? It's that you give. In other words, you put your money where your mouth is, we might say in our parlance. God the Father gives. This is reinforced in a book like Romans chapter 8 where an early follower of Jesus Uh, came to be a leader named Paul, wrote these words to a young church in the city of Rome. He said, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And notice how he describes God the Father here. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? What's the logic there? If God gives what is most precious to him, Why do we sweat the smaller stuff? I mean, the most precious thing to God the Father is His perfect Son, the exact imprint of His nature, the radiance of His own goodness and glory. Now, 
notice how the same writer, Paul, thinking back to the time, because Paul, by the way, if you don't know, used to hate the church, used to hate the Jesus movement, as they would think of it in the first century. He was a religious professional called a Pharisee who devoted his time and his energies and his intellect and his resources to wipe Christianity off the face of the earth. And then Jesus got a hold of his heart. And Paul so identified with what Jesus had done for him, he describes his connection to Jesus in this way. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who what? Loved me and gave himself for me. I, I, I've searched this for years. This is the most personal I can ever find the Apostle Paul describing the love of Jesus for him. It's not that Paul doesn't think he doesn't love you or me. He just says, for a moment, I gotta step away from my sermon and I gotta just think, I can't believe he loves me. You ever have that moment? I can't believe he loves me. If you, say, if you haven't had that moment, you haven't had an honest conversation with your spouse. Have an honest conversation with your spouse and say, name three things about me that annoy you. <laughs> Doesn't take long. I mean, at least I only get three? I mean, come on, man. You're killing me here, right? I mean, often we, when we take away the romanticized stuff about marriage and the gooey feelings and we actually live some life and you really learn what sinners we are, how self-serving we all are, and somebody lives with you and they know that about you, and I think, wow, and she still stands with me and loves me. And the Apostle Paul says, when I think of what I did, and still he gave his life for me. The Father gives, the Son gives, because Jesus is called Everlasting Father and shows us the love the Father has for us. But he also shows us, as we'll see, the protection, the protection of his children, which a father, I believe, is uniquely called to provide, the protection of his children. Notice Psalm 68, verse 5. For those of you that I mentioned earlier that may struggle with a less than ideal father, God is described as the father of the fatherless and the protector of widows his God and his holy habitation. The ancient world, you know who were the most disposed of, marginalized, rejected people? It was typically women and orphans who did not in a patriarchal age have the protection of a man or a group of men and God comes along and says, I know society doesn't see you, but I do and I am a father to you who are fatherless. I am a protector of those widows who are out left, often hung out to dry in that day and age. See this again in a passage like Deuteronomy 10. He, that is God the Father, executes what? Justice for the fatherless and the widow. And he loves the sojourner. You know who the sojourner is? He's the outsider. She's the outsider. If you've ever read the book of Ruth, it's, it's, I think, my favorite Old Testament book. I've preached it twice here, actually, at CFC in the years because I just have loved it so much. You see God's heart for the outsider. Ruth is from Moab, an enemy nation of the people of Israel. What happens at the beginning of the book? Her husband dies, and her mother-in-law, Naomi, says, Ruth, honey, you're a beautiful woman. You're young. You could get a man like that. Just stay here, snap your fingers, and there'll be another guy at your beck and call. And she says, I, I can't. She goes, wherever you go, mother, I will go. Your people are going to be my people, and your God's going to be my God. And we get the glimpse into her conversion. She understands, even in the fields of Moab, that there's a God in Israel who loves her and will welcome her because he loves he doesn't just tolerate. He loves the sojourner. He loves the refugee. He loves the one who is outside without the benefit of protection. Passage that literally changed my life. I've talked about this many times. 
and I have to guard emotions here in these final minutes, so I'm doing that. I'm, I'm serious. If some of you would pray, you know I've got that extra shot of estrogen that I got at birth that uh, Lisa says it's only going to get worse as I get older. Pray for the next few minutes. I mean that. Jesus in Luke chapter 7 comes to an obscure town called Nain. It's only in this passage. Anywhere in the Bible we find Nain mentioned. As he draws near to the gate of town, behold. In other words, Luke's saying, look, check this out. That's what behold means. A man who had died was being carried out. Who was this man? Well, he was an only child of his mother. Oh, and his mother was a widow. What does that mean? She had two men in her life. And they're both gone. And there's a crowd. And Jesus is on his way to do big things. He's ultimately going to surrender his own life in the city of Jerusalem. He's got miracles to perform. He's got teaching to give. And in the midst of this swarming crowd, he sees her, and he has compassion on her and says, do not weep. And that sets up a beautiful story. I don't have time to develop it, but I'll rob you of the, of the suspense. He raises this son from the dead and gives him back to his mother one of those rare passages is no teaching moment he doesn't use it as an opportunity to give a spiritual principle like he does so many other times he just sees a woman loves her and restores her joy and moves on because that's who jesus is so we see that in a passage like matthew 19 as well the children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray you know who was else marginalized in the first century children it, it, it's kind of disturbing we have the Dickens Victorian Christmas sentiment the tiny Tim children kind of ever since the 18th century the Victorians especially helped impart to us I think a healthier view of children sometimes romanticized right because we we know who our kids are right little packets of unregenerate wickedness we all know that but we also know that God loves them and we love them in the first century children were considered literally just Better to be seen and not heard and rarely seen. That's why this passage, it doesn't seem shocking to us because we're used to Victorian sentiment, but it was shocking in its original day. The children were brought to him that he might lay hands on them and pray. That's why you can get the spirit of the age. The disciples rebuked the people. Oh, get these little snot rags out of here. Jesus is an important person with important things to do. Get these, these human beings in waiting out when, when they're older and they're men and women then they can have a seat at the table but not right now and what does jesus do he says let the children come to me don't you dare hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven i don't say this enough but what um natalie headley our kids ministry director and her entire team are doing in the back section of our building i believe with all my heart may very be well be the most important thing happening in our church more so than what's even happening in here this morning do you believe that what she is doing what that team is doing this morning it is a reflection of jesus heart towards those children let them come let them learn i know they're hard to manage i know the behavior is tough i know there's challenges i know they're overwhelming but let them come because i love them and i want them to come to me notice how jesus deals with the outsider the sick and the ceremonially unclean and look, look again, Matthew says, here is a leper, comes to Jesus, kneels before him and says, Lord, and notice, he banks all of his hope, maybe, maybe, he has no doubt about Jesus' power, but he has a question, does he want to? Jesus has the power to heal, he's heard stories, but does he have the want to? Lord, if you will, you can make me clean, and Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. You don't touch a leper, not in that day and age, but Jesus touches that leper and says, I will, I want to. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Jesus is like his father, right? A father to the fatherless. Gives justice to the father, uh, fatherless. Protection to the widow, to those that have been shelved by society. John 10, notice how Jesus describes himself. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life 
for his sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not, I love this, own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. I've shared this before. I, I, always, I don't know why this one speaks to me. When I have to go into a hardware store, I have a panic attack. If I go into a bookstore, I'm happy as, as can be. I go to a hardware store to get something called an uh, Allen wrench. I don't know what that is. guess it's the dude who invented it. Who am I looking for? I'm just going to be honest. I'm not just looking for the orange vest. I'm looking for the orange vest who's a grandfather, right? Who's probably built things his whole life, who's kind and compassionate. I'm not looking for the 16-year-old who's checking his cell phone, right? Who I'm not, hey, buddy, uh, trying to find something. It's, uh, it's a certain tool invented by Alan, what? Oh, it's over there. I want the guy who's going to tell me the story, right? Who's maybe it's his second job. It's his kind of semi-retirement job. What? Because he, he owns what he's doing, right? I doubt he's working at Home Depot to get rich. Probably paying a couple of bills, and he actually likes it. He owns. Think of what Jesus is saying here. He says, the hired hand is there to collect a check. I'm not here to collect a check. Jesus says. I'm here to lay my life down for my sheep who I love and I will die and bleed for. So that's most of this message. Jesus is called Father, but the adjective should not be lost on us. Because he is not just Father, he is everlasting father here's where I'd really appreciate some prayer if you've been here for any length of time I mean it's going way back now it's been uh, wow hard to believe over eight years since uh, my family lost a wonderful man I'm going to show you a picture this is my wife's father Steve Leslie it's how I always think of a strong young there he is at Sunset Beach with my uh, three at the time, hinting at the fourth to come in a T-shirt called Ella's. I just like that. And there's Ella a couple years later. Steve was a wonderful man. Wonderful husband. Wonderful father. Really a, a father to me. Um, and he died in 2011. 63 years old, and, and he was looked like that, just young, strong. His mother lived to 101, and certainly we thought Steve would, you know, give uh, the fight of his life a run for its money, but God had plans to call him home at what seems to me as I get older, a very young age. My kids adored him. And when he died... <laughs> I never knew that something was happening in the background. I want to show you another picture. That's my father. It's Milt Dutcher. Oh, I can't say enough about. After my father-in-law died, I never knew this till my mother told me a couple years later. My father, who grew up in upstate New York, kind of dusted off his ice skates. He was quite a hockey player in his younger years. He hadn't skated for many years. So, he, on his own, went out to the ice rink six or seven times to get his skate legs back. I never knew this. So that he knew my kids who were struggling could have an experience. He could make a special investment in them give him a little extra attention. We talked about that some years later, and I said, Dad, you didn't have to do that. He goes, well, I wanted to, Greg. I can't replace Steve, but I feel like I can do a little bit more. Do you understand when I said, when I learned that God was a father, when my heart leapt for joy? It's hard to say, but we know the fact. He's a wonderful father, but 
he one day will be gone. And my kids are old enough that I tell them that I one day will be gone. And many of you are grieving this Christmas because your father is gone. And when you think of him and you think of the memories, it stirs you. That's why I was so moved last year. Now, I, I want to preface this next thing I show you, that I am not making a political statement. If, if you know me at all, I do not touch politics from here and never will. We're going to find our unity in Jesus. We're going to find our unity in what, who he is and what he's done. So I say that because I'm showing you this next clip because I want you to be struck by something you probably saw on TV just a year ago. Would somebody get me a tissue? How did I not bring a tissue? Uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Lisa's going to be so mad at me. Uh, thank you, brother. I do, man, I do. Doing a little better than I intended. But last year around this time, uh, George H.W. Bush died. Now, he lived many years, and some of you probably saw his son's eulogy. I want to show you the last minute of a 14-minute speech that was beautifully crafted, beautifully delivered, appropriate tone, and even the aftermath of that speech. Let me direct your attention to the screen. Well, Dad, we're going to remember you for exactly that and much more. And we're going to miss you. Your decency, sincerity, and kind soul will stay with us forever. So through our tears, let us know the blessings of knowing and loving you, a great and noble man, the best father a son or daughter could have. <laughs> and in our grief, let us smile knowing that Dad is hugging Robin and holding Mom's hand again. struck by that for so many reasons in their time two men were the most powerful men on the planet right for 12 years collectively four years for the father eight years for the son powerful you see the pomp and circumstance even in that great cathedral in D.C. And you may wonder, I've read about this a lot in the last couple of weeks, when uh, former President George W. Bush walks back to his seat, he's laughing because, as he said later, he was so close to finishing without cracking. But he couldn't, could he? Why? Because his father, who he adored, he died. Our best fathers don't last. They die. And so many of our hopes and our affection and our memories just get mangled when they're gone. And that's why it's so special that Jesus is called what? Not just Father, but everlasting Father. Notice what, how God is described in Psalm 90. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you would form the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God the Father. Notice how the Son is described in similar terms, Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. May I share this with you the one last time, the takeaway thought. Jesus is God the Father's perfect expression of both his love for and protection of his children. That's what we prepare our hearts for at Christmas. There is one who is coming. He's a wonderful counselor. He is mighty God. He also shows us the everlasting, undying love and protection of his Father for us. And next week, next week, I hope you will come and bring someone to hear Prince of Peace.
This is the Jesus that we worship. Let me pray. Father, thank you. From everlasting to everlasting, you are, and your Son is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Your love for us is unquestioned. What you have done to secure our forgiveness of sins, what you have done to speak of your affection for us, Lord, how can we ever, ever question how much you must love us? Help us, Father, to receive all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen.